All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Sick Codes. Uh, also, I'm subbing in, as, as Josh just mentioned, for Casey John Ellis. I've got his sunglasses. Who thinks we look actually quite similar? Who's met either of us in person before? Could be related. Yeah, we look pretty similar. And we're both Australian. And he's a little bit taller than me, 6'3". So, um, but yeah, I've got his sunglasses. And when I put these on, you can't tell us apart. Two redheads with red beards, <coughs> receding hairlines. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, this talk's called Hungry Hungry Hackers. Um, it's about food, agriculture, and cybersecurity risk. It's also a Q&A, so I want you to be able to ask questions as well. So I'll talk for probably about 25, 30 minutes. And this other gentleman here, LP, you can ask questions as well. If you have a question that you're thinking about, just write it down on your phone, and I'm, I'm sure we'll do mics or something at the end. <coughs> Just one other thing, I'm incredibly jet lagged, so I apologize if I'm a little bit slow or a little bit doozy. Um, I think I've slept, I went to bed at 1 a.m., I woke up at 3, I went to Denny's, and I couldn't sleep again. So I don't know whether it was the food, but yeah, just incredibly jet lagged. So, because I flew obviously not from, not locally, so, uh, all the way from Thailand. So, yeah, this is independent research um, in that I wasn't paid for some of this stuff, so. Uh, all of the vulnerabilities that I talk about were reported to the vendors and in a, in a, you know, a secure, a responsible disclosure way. Uh, nothing in these talk represents future, past, present employers or contracting, things like that. The contents of the slides are created, created common zero and all of the trademarks belong to the owners of those trademarks. So here's my socials. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, formerly known, oh, X, formerly known as Twitter, LinkedIn, and which is my website, sick.codes. And you can also see Casey, uh, who's also Australian. Um, at, yeah, his links as well, Casey John Ellis or CJE. <clears throat> so what's this talk about? Um, it's about a brief history leading up to now of cybersecurity in agriculture. Now, I think maybe three or four years ago, many people, including myself actually, literally had no idea that there was cyber in agriculture, to be honest. Um, some people, like this other guy here, he'll tell you a different story. He was, you know, obviously he works in the, in the industry, so as far as I know. Um, yeah, so we're talking about current, future, and um, some past stuff. So who's this talk for? Those interested in seeing how a couple of bugs can literally change the trajectory of an entire uh, sector. Uh, in, in fact, it's critical infrastructure sector. So you'll have a talk, I think, following mine about water, and you've had other talks, I guess, on this track today and tomorrow that talk about other industries, medical, and things like that. And ag is, ag as in agriculture, it, it, uh, it needs a couple of eyes on it. And I happen to be the person <clears throat> who put some eyes on it and got a few things to whip up in a bit of a storm. It's also relevant for people who eat food. So it's gonna get a rise of, yeah, most people I assume things. I saw some who didn't put their hand up, but um, <laughs> just wondering how you're still alive. Anyway, birth of an idea. This whole thing came about um, through a friend of mine called Paul Roberts. He uh, writes for his publication, Security Ledger, but um, he also uh, does a bit of right to repair stuff that I'll talk about. He said to me one day in a phone call, he goes, oh, dude, it's so random that John Deere has no CVEs. Wow. Like, and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's right. Shit. Uh, there are no CVEs in John Deere products. He's like, well, man, wonder if someone could go and look at it. You know, he sort of dared me into it. And that's what happened. Literally just said, dude, why does John Deere not have any CVEs? I thought, oh, I'll go change that. That's exactly what we did. So Paul, um, that's Mr. Roberts there, fantastic guy. Um, he, he runs a secure repairs organization, which is a subset of right to repair stuff, which is, in my opinion, right to repair and security are completely, sorry, they have overlap, definitely overlap, but they are separate issues. And Paul is very good at illustrating those issues about, you know, if you, if you can't repair something, then you can't fix it if it's got a fatal critical bug or thing like, things like that, security issue with it. <clears throat> so yeah, I took the bait. Um, Paul literally just said to me, you know, there's no CVEs. I went and, got, went and had a look at it. First thing I did was I signed up to the John Deere website with a developer account, free developer account, um, and then started playing with the software. And there's a form there. I know it's quite zoomed out. This screen's quite small, but it's a form on their back end that allows you to add pieces of equipment to your account. Um, and it says, submit VIN number, vehicle identification number, 
Uh, but for, for combine harvesters and big machines that, that are in agriculture, uh, if you add one to your farm and the farm that's linked to your John Deere account already has that piece of equipment in there, it'll say, error, this account, or this, it says here, equipment already exists. However, in the JSON response, it has the entire account record for that item. So it's got the, it's got the that's the VIN number at the top. Um, you can't see in this, in this JSON, it's a, it's a lot longer than this. And there's actually PII in there. It's got address line one, address line two, city, postcode, you know, lease, lease or, lease e or something like that. And a lot of information in there. Um, <clears throat> and so then at the time, John D didn't actually have a bug bounty program, but I'll get into that in a moment. Um, I actually sent, well, I, I sent it to them to fix and there was a little bit of a, I, I actually did a DEF CON talk about this two years ago, three years ago actually. Um, the remote DEF CON, it was a pre-recorded one about about this issue that we sent them and, and how they stuffed it all up and because they didn't have a bug bounty at the time and all sorts of issues with, with reporting to a program, reporting to a company that doesn't have a bug bounty, it's kind of complex because it's like you send it to them and they don't know what to do and all sorts of stuff happen. They learned their lesson, obviously, a lot of stuff has changed since then. Um, but, you know, because they didn't have a program, I sent it to the news. So I sent it to Vice, um, Lorenzo, and uh, advice, he's actually now at TechCrunch. So is it, t he is, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Paul. <coughs> um, bugs allowed hackers to dox John Deere tractors. The actual original title of this article was bugs allowed hackers to dox all John Deere tractor owners. However, John Deere reached out to Lorenzo and said, um, it's not all tractors, it's only a subset of tractors the ones that are being connected to the website and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, so it's only the connected ones. Anyway, it, it went in circles and, and Lorenzo dropped the word all. And then he also came back to me and said, oh, John Deere also disputed it. And um, John Deere sent them a comment uh, to Lorenzo advice at the time. You know, we were re made aware of misconfigurations, um, separate online actions. We took immediate action, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the last sentence that says, innate did not get access to customer accounts, dealer accounts, sensitive PII. Now think about that last one, sensitive PII, sensitive um, personal information. My thought was, it was that true because when I was looking at the records, I could see address line one, first name, last name, all that details. Um, and I think the key word there was the word sensitive because I think it's something to do with, if it doesn't have an SSN or someone in the audience will, will have a better, a better explanation what the difference between PII and sensitive PII is. But um, John Deere, you know, anyway, I showed it to Lorenzo. I said, look, this is pretty, you know, it's the real record. And he said, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so that was, I call that hacking for clout because I didn't hack, I didn't get paid by John Deere. There was no bug bounty involved. In fact, at the time, John Deere didn't have a bug bounty. They created a bug bounty for me. Um, and it was also a private program with no bounty <laughs> and no disclosure. <laughs> And I was like, okay, why, why the fuck, <laughs> like, why the fuck would I sign up to that? Um, <clears throat> like, thinking about it, you're getting a private program. Like, the leaderboard is going to be private. It's literally just you and Dia in a private DM together. Here's the bug. Yeah, thanks. No worries. See you. Get out of here. Um, <clears throat> and I want to ask you a question. Why would I sign an NDA with John Dia, um, given they have billions of dollars to spend on bugs? And they, by the way. This is, this is a couple of years ago now. They do have a bug bounty program now and they do pay out. They never paid me any, any money as well, but because um, I rejected the program invite when I got it. But um, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. why would I sign an NDA with John Deere and, and when they have billions of dollars? And then I thought to myself, is it even ethical to ask that? So it's like, think, it's like reverse ransomware kind of, if you think about it. You're asking like, I'm not going to give you that bug because you're not paying for it, so I'll publish it. Um, think about it, yeah. It's kind of sus. <clears throat> um, yeah, so going public with a block, with a going public with a bug, um, you know, you've got clout, or just like you can publish it, you can write about it, people can link to it, you can get stories about it, or you follow the money and you, and you submit it privately to a private program, or in John Deere's case, um, I chose the clout option and just send just sent it, and I wouldn't even be talking to you today if I if I did sign that NDA. So it's cool, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> is publicly roasting companies because I'm technically right now I'm kind of roasting John Deere a little bit. Um, because I didn't, I didn't never, I never signed an NDA with Deer. I've signed NDA with other tractor companies, but not Deer. So, um, Deer will, Deer will get so angry when I tell them that. Anyway, um, 
They're probably watching, actually. So, yeah. So he's publicly roasting a company helpful. Um, there's pros and cons to this, but I want you to think about like, is what I'm doing kind of savage or is it actually an ethical thing to do? But you tell me by the end of the talk if you think that going public uh, about this John Deere stuff was actually you know, in the interest of you all, because you're all here to listen to stuff that uh, if I had signed it, I wouldn't be here. So here's what happens when you publicly disclose a bug in the most uh, outrageous way possible. I think, is this yours? Oh, Paul. <laughs> That's Paul right there. Paul, Paul wrote that story. That's crazy. Um, that was a couple of years ago. Yeah. <clears throat> The author's in the audience. That wasn't planned, by the way. So, um, so I wrote this story uh, a couple of years back called Extraordinary Vulnerabilities Discovered in TCL. Who knows what TCL TVs are? Okay, cool. Because at the time, three, four years ago, almost, yeah, I mean, not many people knew what TCL was. I mean, if you watch the NBA, they're sponsored on everything. Big red Chinese Communist Party backed um, company. And they literally are a, a strong arm tech Literally, that was Huawei, Xiaomi, Xiaomi, um, and a bunch of other companies. And so I published this story about TCL TVs having a backdoor. I called it extraordinary vulnerabilities, but Department of Homeland Security called it a backdoor. Um, and so Paul actually wrote this story, which is crazy. So Department of DHS, sorry, DHS um, basically used this story that I wrote, which was full public, um, didn't sign an NDA with TCL at all. And why would I? Probably, I'd probably get in trouble for doing that anyway. So <clears throat> Homeland Security did a thing about it. And at the time, Acting Secretary Chad Wolf actually went on and said, you know, we're looking into companies such as TCL, who we, it was discovered recently that they incorporated backdoors in their TVs. And I was thinking, wow, shit, that was my bug um, that I published. And so what happened from that? You know, we're talking about this public thing about publicly disclosing bugs. And, and what actually happened was, this is a later event, this, this little study was done there, but um, the share price dropped 15% in one day, which was crazy, because um, they're a massive company. The CEO, who is, a, I think, a CCP committee member, he rebought a certain amount of shares, and then it's all, in actual fact, who knows what the Honor smartphone is, Honor? It used to be the Huawei Honor. So there was a, right, right around this time, 2021, um, just before this, just before this uh, story came out, Huawei was in talks with TCL, both heavily um, CCB companies. Because the Huawei phone was banned to come into the US, the Honor phone, they sold it to TCL uh, in, a, in a joint venture with the Shenzhen government. And right after that, I published this research about TCL and then TCL is getting accused of backdoor. So they basically passed the buck to TCL to try and get it back in the US. And and then TCL was copying heat, so they just basically screwed that entire deal up. And um, I think now they're, a, they're their own company, and they're owned by like 40 companies, and half of them are the government, and yeah, it's chaos. Um, there's a reason why the TVs are cheap. Yeah. So back on topic with John Deere. So do you think uh, John Deere probably would have done things differently in hindsight, given now, given now what I've told you about me publicly ragging on them as, as we speak. I'm literally ragging on them right now. Um, done two DEF CON talks about them. One where I jailbroke a tractor and I'll get into that shortly. <clears throat> but I, I asked, I think about it, would John Deere have done something differently? Probably, yeah. But the main thing is, would I be, would I be here talking to you today if I had not publicly disclosed the stuff about John Deere? I wouldn't, wouldn't be here, wouldn't have done a DEF CON talk. And I encourage you, the audience, to do more public disclosures because it helps the industry. And I'll talk about that why. So, because <clears throat> it might save your business, your industry. Um, companies need to be ready to receive bugs, even if they don't have a bug bounty program. At the time, John D didn't have a bug bounty program. They were forced to create it because of me. Um, and they tried that little NDA shenanigans, which I impolitely declined. I, I actually told them to get, anyway. <clears throat> but yeah, so public disclosure, full, Public disclosure is a form of responsible disclosure. You know, if you if you fully publicly disclose a bug and you send the link straight to MITRE, the the CVE gets instantly published because the the bug is is public. And a lot of uh, ever since this law, another trick as well. After that TCL thing, a couple of months later, 
um, because it was such a massive effect on TCL, massive um, part of the, basically they're spying TVs anyway. So um, the, the government put out new rules saying that in China you must submit CVEs or zero days through the government first or their, their cert, their local cert. Um, and, I, on, and I and Casey, who is, is me, um, we both, on, we both have a big inkling about that and thinking that it's definitely related to the TCL issue because um, straight after that, that massive shenanigan about the share price dropping and TCL and the honor phone and all that stuff, the, the, um, the Chinese government changed it so that you must submit bugs through them. And so some of the Chinese researchers now, they just get on alt accounts on GitHub and they just dump bugs um, publicly when it happens. So that they, I think, um, shit, which one was it? Not, um, what was the big bug a couple of years back? Le Luna, Luna, what was it? Anyway. <clears throat> yeah, so this is a DEF CON talk I did, breaking badly into agriculture. Who's seen this talk? Okay, sweet. <laughs> yeah, so if you remember from that talk, um, there was a John Deere display. I probably should have bought it, actually. It's, uh, anyway, I've still got it. still plays, uh, anyway, I'll explain in that in a minute. But um, yeah, this is the flagship model at the time. Um, yeah, I got an X-Terminal emulator running on it. Uh, I rooted the device, jailbroke it, um, got some code, and then I could run games like Doom. Um, and actually, it's a farming edition of Doom. And you can hunt down pinky demons. Actually, the original version of this, we had we changed some of the monsters to like cows and, and like rabbits and stuff. And then I was I sent it to someone to to say like, oh, what do you think? What do you think? And they're like, dude, you can't kill fucking animals. I'm like. What the, what, this, what's this? The, anyway, this, yeah, apparently it was way too savage. I'm like, dude, it's, it's Doom. Like, the game is fucking violent as shit. Um, <clears throat> and that was the game running uh, on, on the, that was on the stage at DEF CON. Um, but yeah, so sure, should more bugs be publicly disclosed like that? Because, you know, I would have had that cool opportunity to present the John Deere jailbreak on stage at DEF CON. I wouldn't be here. Jo, I wouldn't have met, you know, Josh wouldn't have invited me to chat. Um, had I had I not publicly roasted John Deere, um, but yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Again, had I signed that thing, would I be standing here talking today? And the, obviously, the answer is no. So anyway, what can a jailbroken tractor do? Um, what can a jailbroken tractor to do? Well, if we look back at the conflict in Ukraine, Russia, um, there was a story that came out from CNN. It was kind of strange because. CNN was the original source, and there was like, it had some stuff in there about like sources, and so, anyway, it was quite a quite strange story. However, a lot of people wrote about it, and it was that Russia had stolen five million dollars worth of John Deere farm equipment from a dealership in Melitopol, Ukraine, and they had taken it back to back to um, Russia, and by the time they turned it back on or whatever, apparently the combines had been bricked. Uh, remotely, and so people were actually, John Deere thought it was a win, and then people were saying, well, that's kind of screwed up, because, like, you can just break my tractor, what the hell? Um, and if you think about it, <coughs> yeah, they, they were inoperable. So the problem with that is I just showed you you could play Doom on it. So I became the dealer. So I can, now that I can play Doom on it, I can totally turn that tractor back into a workable state. So I can unbrick the tractor. Same as if you had a, a, a phone, it's iCloud locked, you jailbreak it in some fashion and un, un iCloud lock it. It would be kind of, there would be a market for stolen devices. Um, so yeah, pros and cons of jailbreaking, huge security risk obviously, because I just showed you, you can, you can run your own software on it, you can delete products, you can steal things, you can, it also highlights massive design flaws. So flaws in the, the entire process of, um, <clears throat> of the construction of the product. There are a lot of bugs in there that I found and actually, I haven't told John Deere all of them because they haven't invited me to their hardware security program. So, if you're listening, uh, invite me. <laughs> anyway, uh, allows access to inner working and customization beyond the OEM's original design. So, like, clearly, you're not supposed to play games on there. You're not supposed to put YouTube on there or additional software. And in fact, you can steal intellectual property from it as well. You can take out software, you can reverse engineer products, you can find even more bugs. So I'm a third party, yeah, so loss of IP to a third party, me. So anyway, back on topic, we're gonna talk about some events. 
I know Josh wants me to really talk about events and, and things that are happening in ag since this sort of happened. So here's me doodle daddling and playing with the hardware and showing you how I can, you know, I'm the good guy, right? If you think about it, the bad guys are involved with ransomware. So I'm just showing you, you know, I could jailbreak it. Oh, I can play games on there. John Deere thinks I'm the threat. But the real threat obviously is crime. Um, and I I'll only show this this one, and someone else will probably talk about um, get the gas pipeline, but Colonial Pipeline, uh, a major, 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 major event in the entire industrial, um, so what's it called again? Control. ICS, yeah. ICS, industrial control, control systems, et cetera. Critical infrastructure. You know, US gas stations run dry. Chaos, chaos in the streets. Um, Beef supplier JBS, who knows what JBS is? Okay, JBS is a meat processing company. Uh, I assume they feed to Tyson or something like that and Cargill and whatnot. Basically, yeah, they were big in Australia, big in the US. In fact, I think they're the biggest one in the world. So they paid, I think, $11 million. So they paid $11 million to ransomware um, actors to get their plants processing again. Russian hackers targeted a bunch of Iowa grain co-ops uh, Five point nine million dollars at the ransom, something like that. Yeah, big money, right? Huge money for these criminals. It's all Bitcoin, no tax as well. Um, another thing here: the Task Force on Precision Agriculture. So this is some really interesting task force that came out. This one's more about like GPS and GPRS and things like that. Um, but you can go and watch their their interesting YouTube um, videos. They go for hours and hours and hours, and they and they discuss things. And it's all public, so it's quite interesting run by the FCC, um, but yeah, so these are all in response. So again, Colonial Pipeline, millions of dollars paid, FBI is involved, DOT is involved, Department of Transport, affects gasoline, jet fuel, oil products. Then we got JBS, beef, pork, poultry, poultry. <clears throat> White House is involved, Department of Agriculture is involved, DHS, nine days offline processing meat. Apparently, I think in, in Australia, there were literally trucks of cattle that were waiting to be processed. They, they were just standing at the at the plant. They can't do anything. They can't they can't go anywhere. They just just yeah, chaos chaos. Paid eleven million dollars to fix that. <coughs> Agco, random company, um, another company that's one of John Deere's competitors. I won't get into it, but they make Massey Ferguson, Fent, Challenger, as far as I know. Is that right? Vario, yeah, Vario as well. <clears throat> um, they lost a lot of data. They got hacked big time. Um, two week production halt, as far as I know. Two weeks production. That's that's on the assembly line. Two weeks off. Um, crazy. And uh, if you think about it, um, yeah, major damage, right? Major reputation damage, a little bit. A um, <laughs> little bit. And yeah, just just production in, it's, it's chaos. This one here, Cisco, it's a more recent event. I don't know why there's a battleship in the background in this photo, because it's like a, <laughs> it's like, it's just a picture of a food truck and there's like a fucking warship behind it. So <clears throat> um, they had an event, a security event, the start of last year. Um, someone gained access in January. They didn't find out till March. That's how, you know, we're thinking food processing companies, you know, they're not, you know, they're not like Delta, CrowdStrike, well, um, things like that. Yeah, so apparently they lost 126,000 social security numbers as far as, far as I know. Um, yeah, and yeah, PII, identity theft, things like that. Another one, Dole. Who knows Dole? You know, Apple's and it's got the sticker on it. <laughs> Dole. Um, yeah, they had an issue and again, massive disruption in the supply chain. Unable to stock shelves with certain products um, <clears throat> while, they're, while, they're, while they were being hacked. I don't know if they paid. They probably did. Because um, you can imagine like a fruit packing company is not going to have the same sort of cyber infrastructure as maybe Facebook, you know, or Meta. <clears throat> According to the record.media, food and ag had more than 160 ransomware attacks last year. Now, I will get into this shortly, but the food and ag ISAC um, gets mentioned here. Um, it's kind of an interesting, interesting topic, the ISAC, Information, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. I'm not sure if... Um, yeah, food and, food and ag, there's sort of like a sort of issue going on at the moment about starting that. Uh, I think there should be two separate things, food and agriculture, but we'll get into that. Is food and security 
important enough yet. And obviously, the, if you're thinking about it now, I've told you all this stuff and how important it is, you're thinking, here, yeah, it probably is, right? So what if there was a crowd strike-like attack on the food supply chain? Like how fast? You think about the thousands of Delta flights that were canceled, like four or 5,000 something. Imagine that, but in food. Um, it's kind of, yeah, you kind of grasp the sort of, yeah. Imagine how fast the, co the country would just descend into chaos if people couldn't eat. And not just the United States. Imagine a country that maybe has a single point of failure. Maybe they have one meat packer or they have one grocer or something like that and they get ransomware and the whole, the whole place just shuts down and descends into looting and chaos and, and yeah. Um, but yeah, no need to imagine because we already saw this sort of effect in 2020 or uh, during the pandemic, right? We got people panic, the panic buy, run out, get stuff. Um, and there's this, there was this article, I think this is like an older story, 2008, um, nine meals from anarchy. And it was about basically if oil was to run dry, petrol stations run dry, trucks would stop rolling and supermarket shelves would be bare within three days. That was 2008. I honestly think with the, with the social media, like it would take literally one day. If people caught on that things were running dry, they would go immediately and panic buy. Um, so just keep that in mind when you think about is food security or food and agriculture an important sector? And obviously it, it should be, and it is. And so for John Deere, it became a massive priority after I hacked them. Um, prior to this, they had nothing on their website about cyber. I think since I hacked them two or three years ago now, I've been hacking them a couple of times since. Mm -hmm. They've been putting it in their annual report, so that's good to see. In fact, they've actually done a lot since then, and I will give them credit, obviously, because at the time that they started Bug Bounty and things like that, they were the industry leader because they were the only company that had a Bug Bounty at the time, as far as I know. So apparently they had a John Deere Defense System Cyber Center that runs 24-7, 365, and I'm like, well, where the fuck were they when I, when I hacked them the first time? <laughs> I wasn't able to get, yeah, about six years ago. I'm like, well, I only hacked you guys three years ago, so. Um, yeah, and they started last year, they started the Cyber Tractor Challenge. So I'm giving them massive credit here. They started this 501c3 where, um, who knows what the Cyber, food, what is the Cyber Truck Challenge? There's a whole bunch of them, yeah, cool. There's a whole bunch of them. There's like a Cyber Boat Challenge and things like that. Basically, people in the industry in that sector come together play with each other's machines, <laughs> it sounds good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they <clears throat> get people in to hack them. And if we look at the 2024 version, that's the one that just got done a couple months back, I think, it was a couple months ago, something like that, yeah. Um, and as you can see, there's more than John Deere, because John Deere is the green one. Uh, you got John Deere, Case NH, they don't like me, by the way. Um, John Deere again, Fent, and I think Massey Ferguson on the last one. Um, and as you can see, that's multiple competitors coming together as an industry to work on the same sort of product product problem. <clears throat> Which is kind of strange when you think about it. It's like all these companies, they're, they're a total competitors to each other that would get a competitive edge if they were able to get ahead of their competitor. If you know what I'm saying, you get what I'm saying, right? They, they've got cyber auto, cyber medical, cyber drone, cyber boat. Um, and this is a kind of funny thing. They're talking about the guy who, who co-founded or founded those other ones I think it's Carl Carl Heimer. He was doubting that John Deere would doubting that John Deere would could pull it off, and they actually did pull it off. So the first year was just John Deere's products, and I think that's something to do with five hundred one c three status or something. You have to do a bit of business first to turn it into a charity. I'm not sure because um, I don't. I'm not from the United States. So. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't invited to that cyber truck tr cyber ag cyber tractor challenge, and I asked them if I could go, and they said no. And it's because of one of the companies that was there, they don't like me. And I can understand why, because I also hacked them as well. Um, and I wasn't as, yeah. But John, by the way, John Deere and it, my, myself, we're very friendly now. Um, and we got each other on LinkedIn. We talk, we talk to the security team and things like that. But also the other companies, we've got JCB, I've spoke to Caterpillar, we've got Trimble, all of these other companies that saw the John Deere talk and learned from it and go, oh shit, that affects our industry too. Or we're mining, or we're, you know, we're, the, uh, mining or, or, or we're logging or other industries or earth, earth, move, earth moving, earthworks, <clears throat> they all have similar products. You know, you've got a CAN bus controlled vehicle, even automotive, it, you know, someone coming in and hacking the, the infotainment system in the car or hacking the, 
display system in the tractor or the, or the, the big cater, caterpillar uh, mining truck. Everyone sort of caught onto it. Mining as well. Mining was a really big one. They've got their shit together. Um, mining. They've got their own ISAC. They've got you know annual meetings, and there's no. Yeah, I'll show you what happens when you don't work as an industry on 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 uh, securing each other's products. So Deer went from no bug bounty two years ago to running the industry event, the Cyber Tractor Challenge, with two of its direct competitors. Um, so yeah, good on you, Deer. That's good. Um, <clears throat> so where are we going with food and agriculture now? Um, there's still no real ISAC. Now, there is a food and ag ISAC. Um, and again, that's information sharing and analysis center. These are the current members of the food ISAC. As you can clearly see, they're mainly food companies. We've got you know, Pepsi, Cargill, Tyson, Lamb, something, and potatoes. Um, <clears throat> like these have, like what does a potato have to do? It's a kind of, a, actually, that's a pretty bad example because it's directly related. But what would a packet of PepsiCo Doritos have to do with a five hundred thousand dollar combine harvester. There's literally there's a lot of different, you know, there's there's a, there's a stark contrast. And I think honestly, food and ag ISAC should split up. There should be a food ISAC. There should be an ag ISAC. And John Deere and its and its cons, uh, John Deere and its competitors that I mentioned here. We got CNH, CNH, Agco, Class. Who else is there? That's the big four, right? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, there's only four major ones. Um, they should probably come together and get organised because if you don't, um, legislation happens, right? So mining doesn't have this problem. Um, fishing might be probably doesn't have this problem. <coughs> if you don't work together as a as like an industry with your competitors, the 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 Congress will get involved. So that's what actually happened. So recently, um, bipartisan Tom Cotton from Republican. Kirsten Gillibrand or Gillibrand, they actually came together and said, okay, we need a bill that is literally called the Farm and Food Security Cybersecurity Act. So they came up with a bill um, and it's quite, it's quite stern. It's quite, it's quite harsh. It's like, you need to do certain things every year, certain tests every year. We need to be doing all this stuff. And I'm like, well, dear and, and co, dear and co and all of the other conspirators, uh, competitors. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe you should all work together and do this, make this stuff yourself before Congress makes bills for you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the bill's quite long. Talks about the, the, like you have to study threats to food and ag, the impact of threats to production and processing and distribution, readiness of federal, state and um, local uh, governments and existing policies and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, this stuff sounds like ISO standard stuff. Like, why couldn't you do this? without legislation. Anyway, so I'm, I'm personally against, I'm more against deregulation, I prefer a less intrusive government. Um, but the, the bill is literally begging the industry to get organized um, before Congress does it for you. And that's what they're literally doing. So all of these papers have come out since the Iowa grain, grain co-ops got hacked, since I hacked John Deere and, and all the other things that happened and this big whirlwind of stuff happening about, about cybersecurity and agriculture. and people learning about what can go wrong if, if, if you know, say, say, say for example, John Deere, <coughs> main, 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 the main center of John Deere, the John Deere Information Center and in wherever it is, Iowa Data Center, gets hacked and someone pushes out a malicious update to every single John Deere tractor and you have to go and manually fix the blue screen on it, literally like CrowdStrike, right? This is a possibility. You, you know, you have an insider threat, someone who works there an activist or something wants to push a massive update out to all of the John Deere tractors and brick them. And this is this stuff that's actually possible. Um, and it would be cool if they worked together and sort of listed this stuff out. Um, yeah, so USDA is making their own reports about it. Yeah, USAID is even chiming in. Um, I don't know, but yeah, this one talks about more about smaller nations and how they can get severely affected. Like US, pretty resilient. We've got a lot of different manufacturers and it's kind of diverse in terms of um, risk, but there are com countries that would be much smaller and much more error prone. Anyway, so there's the last couple of slides before we get into a bit of Q&A. ISO standards. So um, automotive has its ISO standard, 21434, specifically for road vehicles. Um, and I mentioned that because um, it, it, if it's specifically for cars on the road. However, there are manufacturers like buggies and motorbikes and cranes and things that use the same 
OEMs and infrastructure and stuff to build the same products. They're just not on the road. But they just they follow the same ISO standard because it's a good standard. They don't have to follow it. They just follow it because it's good, right? Um, as far as I know, agriculture is working on one. It's in a draft status. They should probably hurry up, like I said, before legislation comes in and forces them off. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's as far as I know, they're working on that. Um, 24889. 24889, the ISO standard, so for the, for the recording. Um, yeah, auto has a, its own ISAC. I'm comparing it to auto because you'll see in the next slide why. Um, the auto ISAC, really well done. They've got the ASRG, I think it is, an Automotive Security Research Center. They do pen tests, they have AGMs, all this cool stuff, and look how many people work together on it. Um, you know, like yeah, everyone, like everyone, Polaris, Volvo, Everyone, Matt Morelli, Mazda, everyone's there. <coughs> Even John Deere's there um, in Case New Holland. They're relatively new members, two new members, because they understand that the food and ag ISAC, who's claiming to be food and ag, should probably split up. They should have an ag ISAC. should be just the big four or five or whatever manufacturers. Or they should say, look, we've got the auto ISAC that covers it. Because, again, the combines and stuff, they do go on the road, um, and they probably can follow the 21434 that we mentioned. But the new one that you've... I don't know what it is. You said it already, but I forgot. But um, anyway, let's get into some questions, I think. So that's, the, that's my presentation for today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I got one. Yeah, I got one. Yeah. Can you, you should be able to hear me okay? Okay. So I'll throw some, before we do Q&A, just some really, you can stay up if you want me, some, some really quick facts. Um, so my name is LP, I work in the industry, I do cybersecurity for ag, I've been doing that for probably as long as that's existed as a thing you can do, I guess. Um, so Josh asked me to talk a little bit about uh, what happens next, and I think Sick had a slide about this. So. Yeah, the websites have been hacked, right? The back end to connected systems. A tractor has been hacked. And that's kind of the cool, sexy thing that everybody thinks about. Like the big risk is what if my tractor gets hacked? Um, just some really quick stats, kind of depending where you look on the internet. Um, various government agencies believe between five and 10% of the US GDP is directly ag related. So not like tier two, tier three kind of stuff, but direct GDP from ag, let's say it's 10, 10%, which is astronomical, right? It's a really big portion of the US GDP. Um, a significant thing to note is food and ag is one of the scissor critical infrastructure sectors. We're in there. Our sector plan hasn't been updated since 2015. The landscape of everything involved in ag since 2015 is very different. And that's the same for food production as well, once you move a crop into a factory to have some kind of consumer good made out of it. Um, and so that's nine years, right? 2015 is nine years ago, just a pretty long time. Um, so that kind of gets us to like, okay, what's, what's next, right? It's a big industry, a machine, back end of a machine has been affected. Um, there's this really interesting thing that happens when you begin to look at cross-sector stuff. Uh, and so I think we're gonna hear a little bit about water and maybe power at some point today. Um, one of the big things really is, is rail is a huge cross-sector concern for ag. So if you move past what happens if I attack one person's tractor or one person's farm, how do I affect an industry? The things we know about is like USDA says, depending where in the country you are, after harvest time, 30 to 50% of all grain moves by rail. I think probably most people here know rail infrastructure is old and people are already finding vulns in it. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of a huge thing that has to be considered in the system of growing food and getting it to consumers. Um, Sick made a really interesting comment about diversity of manufacturing and not really sole sourcing suppliers. That's kind of true. Josh and I have had a lot of talks about this over about the last year. And there are some definite points where certain types of goods like rubber goods or electronics like ECUs, 
uh, yeah, maybe they're not sole supplier, but maybe there's two. And, and what happens if that's affected? Um, I, I think that the nine days number is, is not that far off as well, right? I, I think you, there are some good use cases for places like the Ukraine right now and Russia itself where you can see how rapidly machinery begins to degrade when you don't have a part supply. Uh, another one, so another like critical sector obviously that applies to us is fuel. Uh, and I'm going to link that to finance as well. So, so the ones I have really are chemical, comms, energy, IT, transportation, water, and finance. When the pipeline thing happened, everyone believes this is like an ICS thing, right? But actually what happened is their financial system went down and their way to sell oil stopped. And so they just stopped pumping oil. So it's like, okay, yeah, that's deeply important. A combine's not going to run, a tractor's not going to run without fuel. But that was actually an attack on our financial system. Um, so that's, that's a really big one, a cross-sector um, concern, I think, that's, that exists. Um, and then obviously water. I think we'll hear about water maybe in the, the next talk. There's a great, a great talk at DEF CON in 2018. Ben Nassi, who's a, a researcher from Israel, um, with some students, found and built a botnet from internet-connected irrigation systems. And, and these things like commercial Raspberry Pis with like Raspbian, the default creds, and they're just online controlling water. And the research showed, uh, I got numbers from their paper this morning, with 1,400 of these devices, they could drain like a standard American municipal water tower. It's like the big bubble on a stick in one hour. And in most places in the nation that they did an analysis, if they had 24,000 bots, they could drain whole like county-wide uh, reservoir, like flood water and retention reservoirs, which is astronomical water drain. Um, and so things like this are not really yet being considered either by the government or the industry. I, th I think the industry has a pretty good handle on it. Obviously, there's always interaction right between industry versus like making a profit and regulation. Um, but the government definitely, I think, is not aware of how interconnected some of these things are. Um, and so the reason we're bringing them up today really is with Josh kicking off his new project this morning, this is a pretty good time to really talk about big cross-sector uh, cross concerns that we have. Um, and especially since we're doing the ag thing, why not bring it up? Um, a, a note on this, uh, this, this last slide that Sick had about the Cybersecurity Act of 2024. Is it, la is it still up? Yeah. It's here somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. You said you didn't write. A couple of people in this room were in Congress in January talk, talking to people about what, what makes sense to be in the bill, right? One of the good things is this initial bill is exploratory. It gives the industry time to work together. Uh, it's really a bill about doing an investigation, writing a report, identifying big threats. I, th I think Josh and I are pretty confident all of the biggest threats won't be towards a singular industry. They'll be there'll be cross-sector threats that really grind things to a halt as a system. Um, I, I think probably Q&A now, right? Yeah. So we're going to go into Q&A now, but here's the thing. It's questions and answers, no comments, OK? So if you make a comment, I'm going to take the mic back. So you got to have a, a fast, no kidding, <coughs> fast question. You'll get a fast answer. Hang on. Dave. Thanks, everyone. Great, uh, great presentation. Great message. Uh, just curious. A lot of us here um, are here for uh, their technical proclivities, but uh, for the non-technical person, what can the non-technical person do to help solve cybersecurity problems in critical infrastructure like agriculture or others? Yeah, I think, like I said, working together, working with other companies in the industry, like cyber is a shared risk, and you have to, like. <laughs> Ask this guy, how difficult do you think, you're just thinking, how difficult do you think it was for DIA to pick up the phone and say, hey, CNH, hey, Agco, let's work on fixing this issue in our industry. How difficult would that have a phone call be? Or do you think that was the original plan? And I'm sorry, I, I questioned you, question with a question to this guy, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good, 
So your question, it, it, obviously difficult, right? Yeah. The, the answer is extremely difficult. Yeah. Especially when you're a public company yeah. uh, and your industry hasn't gone through like the cyber thing. You, you see this pattern, right? It's over and over and over. It's like yeah. you can't work with the competition. It's a competitive advantage. Our lawyers will be mad. Shareholders will be mad, blah, 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 right? And, and what happens is the big bad will happen to someone. And then kind of slowly, everyone's like, oh, this other industry did this. And security actually only happens when we all do it together, right? I think so, you're right. You call it the, the big bad. Yeah. yeah. That's actually what, yeah, I think. Because when I hacked DR, <clears throat> all of the competitors were like, oh, shit, that could happen to us. Uh, yeah, you, you, you might know about it. Another industry knows about it. Uh, sorry, all the other competitors. And they would reach out to me eventually and be like, oh, dude, I love that talk about this, that. And we also are implementing some changes at the company now because of that. Or, you know, I, I remember one guy at Trimble that I spoke to who was at DEF CON. He said um, the year after we spoke, Trimble's a guidance company, GPS that actually feeds into a lot of the ad companies as well, and also a, a bunch of other industries as well. And they, they're like, I was like, hey dude, what's, what hap what, what's happened in the last year? He's like, oh dude, I got a whole team now. You know, he's able to access the CEO and be like, oh dude, we need a team. Look at this talk, we need a team now. So I think, I think you're right. The industry might need an event. Um, but but his, your question initially is like, how do we as mostly ostensibly like deeply technical people relay these things to people that are not, right? And, and I think the answer is, one is like knowing or being someone that's really good at communications, right? You have to tailor a message to the audience. A lot of times doing that through examples, right? Like the, the biggest thing is communication and outreach. You kind of like, it's easier if you stick to a thing you know. So if you don't know anything about ag, I wouldn't say like, hey, go and give these talking points to just some random guy driving a tractor, right? Oh. Right. But, but it is like people you know in a community you know is trying to build good mental models for them that they can understand, like relate it to something else and, and explain those things, then it does get a bit tricky, right? Ultimately, with most things that are in the industry, you, you vote with money, right? And so if people are buying things in any industry and you want to promote secure things, one of the best things you can do is like, oh, you know, I heard you're gonna go buy like whatever, a new electric bicycle. I just happened to see like this one's really secure and that one's kind of this random thing. And, S stuff like that, I think, really is where it begins. Cool. All right, as fast as you can. Um, I'm only familiar with farms that do fruits and vegetables. So when you're talking right. about the ISAC not really making sense for food and agriculture, like agriculture, can you draw the distinction, TLDR, like what you see as the division? Yeah, for me, I'm th when I think when I think agriculture in my head, I'm thinking like smart ag, because for me, like there's no security in a potato in the ground. Do you know what I mean? There's like, but when you think about for me, it's the machines and stuff like that, the hardware stuff, because I'm a hardware hacker. Um, I think so, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> like, I focus on you know, that half of it. And so, for me, you know, the bag of chips at the whatever is not relevant to me. That's how I just think that I do it like that. But I think there's an issue with this. The, the food and ag ISAC is run by the IT ISAC. Um, and as you can see, like no one's picking up on it. Like the, the, the bigger thing is that, like the food and ag ISAC appears right now to be geared towards food, like food production once it's left a field, yeah. right? Yeah. And and so that gap of like the OEM to how does that thing get on a truck or in a train is is what's not covered there really. But again, when we we talk about that, we're splitting it up. But we we both agree that it's all part of the system as well. Yeah, and it needs to be that as well. So maybe they need to. Yeah, I just, I just personally, I think they, they, they should get a little bit more organized, the, the companies and the ISAC, yeah. Awesome stuff. Uh, this is probably for LP, but either one of you. Um, we're talking about cross-sector dependencies. You're gonna hear from Christian DeBeth uh, later about hospitals closing in rural America. You're gonna hear about water in a minute. Yeah. Um, given the concentration of how many crops are done by fewer mega farms now, and geographically, What's the nexus of if a hospital goes down, does it affect the workforce or production? Uh, if there's a water attack, does it affect overwatering or underwatering? Has anyone looked at the, the which parts of the country can't have a hospital failure, that type of thing? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, Iowa? I, I think some, some, I mean, so like, you actually asked me this a few weeks ago, right? I think to prime it, and I've, I cannot stop thinking about it all the time, specifically the hospital thing. Some of them are really obvious, right? If there's, a, if there's a, some kind of water impact, 
in, in a crop heavy farming kind of region, like obviously, yeah, there's huge impact. I think but, weather, weather's a really good example, right? Because weather's unpredictable. Yeah. And it can affect an entire year's crop, right? It, can it, destroy- it is. But then like what he's talking about, like this, so there's this like interesting thing happening, rural hospitals all over America closing due to lack right. of funding, uh, aggregation of resources, bigger hospitals, right, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, what, what happens, right? If you're the 70 year old guy and you're out on the farm, and you fall off the tractor or you get in some kind of small industrial accident, right? Is, is there an impact regionally to farming? And I think, yeah, reasonably after thinking about it for two weeks, obviously people are less inclined to get the care they need. That takes them out of the field, production slows down. Is there some kind of event horizon where if too many close, one of the things people care about is healthcare. Either they don't get it so production suffers or people choose to stop doing that job. I think it's a real, it's absolutely a real thing that's not considered. I've got one note to that. I remember Kevin Kenny saying to me, when Akamai went down briefly, I think about one and a half years ago, two years ago, John Deere Operations Center is behind Akamai and um, Kevin called me up and go, dude, Kevin's from Nebraska, really funny guy. <clears throat> and he's like, dude, fuck it, uh, the John Deere Operations Center's down. And I'm like, that's my American accent, brother. That was really <laughs> good. Good, <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he, he's like, dude, it's down. I'm like, dude, what does that mean? He's like, there's not enough toilet paper in the Midwest to clean this mess up. <laughs> and it's stuck in my head, that quote. So, you know, that, that John Deere Operations Center is where some of the information about guidance and stuff goes back. It's also the place where I was able to submit VIN numbers and get information back about uh, the customers. Um, but yeah, if that goes down, then, yeah. I mean, what would the, what would the, the other comp- competitors, they're not as much, I don't know much about the competitors. So I know a lot about John Deere though. Because I've hacked them a lot. So, I mean, all of the big ones are global multinationals, right? Right. right. And they, right. Okay. Perhaps the last question. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously everyone would notice, and it would suck really bad if like every John Deere tractor in the country got bricked. Mm-hmm. But critical infrastructure is a geopolitical issue, and so what if there was hypothetically a piece of malware that made everything in a certain fleet three percent less effective? Like how? Maybe it oversprays or they're not on mm-hmm. track as much as they should be. How resilient do you think the industry is to that? And then on top of that, how quickly do you think that would even be tracked as a cyber issue and not just a mechanical one or farm failure or something like that? I mean, complex topic. I'm not the best at, at the at the small scale code stuff on the ECUs, but I know from a competitor that I was, well, I can't talk about it, NDA, fuck. <laughs> so let's let's so let's that's a real that one's an interesting question, right? So let's say, what what do you? The, the first question you can ask is, what kind of gain do you get from smart and precision agricultural equipment that you don't get from someone manually sitting in a cab? Right. And and you get wildly varying claims, right? But kind of the industry, you see numbers that I never see anything that exceeds ten percent, and that seems to be the high end. Right? You buy this one expensive system, you'll get single digit percentage gain, which is still huge. Um, but there's a lot of variability in soil quality and bugs and weather and, and whatnot, right? I think it would take maybe until you're kind of a co-op selling grain before someone noticed in the data. And I'm not sure it'd be agricultural companies as much as it would be financial people doing like stuff with futures, right? Realizing a, a consistent, significant uh, disparity, but that, that may not be true, and it's kind of a guess, right? Um, do I think that could happen? Yeah, I absolutely think it could. Do I think 3%, if you could affect everything, 3 or 4%, at a nation state level, that's giving someone a huge advantage. So definitely a thing that has to be watched out for. But also the solutions to that come to some really common cybersecurity stuff, right? It's like, it's like sign code and make sure you'll only accept a signed update on an ECU. Um, don't, don't give half a million machines all the same key, right? When you sign that software, stuff like that. Or if you have root, like I did on TND, you can, <laughs> you can, you can. Don't, don't let people be root. Yeah, you can yeah. change it. Skip key check equals like one. So yeah. you, can, you can sign your own packages and update it. So I think that was the last question, right? Is anyone, if anyone has asked this question, you can come up, I guess, after like congregate or something. Yeah. Please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers.